It is my great pleasure to welcome to the podium, to be inspired, to be blessed, to be uplifted, our beloved pastor, Reverend John Scott. Reverend John, we welcome you. Thank you, Reverend Sidney. Happy New Year, family. Happy New You and Happy New Year. Happy New You to all who are listening in or viewing us on the World Wide Web. It's warm here in Jamaica and slightly overcast, so just a nice cool breeze coming from up north, but you know, no need for winter coats. So if you can, come on down and share the warmth with us. And if not, let the love that we radiate from beautiful Jamaica fill your homes and your hearts and your consciousness and keep you warm and cozy and snug. Happy New Year, all. Welcome to part one of our 2018 goal setting exercise, which I have dubbed Triple Jump. And I, I have to thank Margarita Rain for the inspiration for this um, this theme because I, I read one of her blogs uh, which you can find on freeandlaughing.com and this blog was called Three Steps to Leap into 2018 and I thought yes um, we will take a hop, a step and a jump and when I was at school we called it hop, skip and jump. Did you call it hop, skip and jump? Yes. Into a new experience. But you know just like an athlete who dreams of standing on the podium, hopefully in the gold medal position, we have to do some training in order to ensure that we are not only physically prepared, but are also mentally and emotionally fit, eh? So today is a training day. Let us affirm together. Today I write it on my heart that every day is the best day in the year. Today I write it in my heart that every day is the best day of the year. Today I let go knowing that this is my best year ever. Today I let go knowing that this is my best year. Let me hear it. Let me hear it with more, with more oomph. Today I let go knowing that this is my best year ever. To your neighbor say, write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. Write it on your heart that every day is the best day of the year. Write it on your heart that every day is the best day in the year. And having written it on your heart, open your heart and let it in. Today's encouragement, as I call my Sunday messages, is titled, Let Go or Be Dragged. And I got it from a little post-it on a friend's computer. She had it over her mouse pad. Let go or be dragged. You see, we're all familiar with the much-touted phrase, let go and let God, aren't we? People in New Thought use it all the time. And I can tell you, I am an expert at letting go. For instance, every year for the past 30 or so years at this goal-setting workshop, I have let go of impatience. <laughs> I used to so want to let go of impatience that I couldn't wait for the next year's New Year's workshop to let it go. And then it began to dawn on me, after many years of futile letting go, that if I indeed had let it go, I wouldn't have to be letting it go every first Jan Monday in January. So I'm a let it, I'm a let it go. Isn't that just how, how, how it happens to us all the time? There are things that we have so deeply ingrained in us, habits and ideas and old hurts and old beliefs that we simply don't let go or don't seem to be able to know how to let go. I know a woman who is still crying over a boyfriend who walked out on her while she was pregnant with their child, by the way. All her friends advise her to let it go and get on with her life and say to her, he's not worth it. And she said, Reverend John, that's okay for them to say, but the picnic look like more like him father every day. <laughs> and so every time she sees her own child, whom she loves dearly, it reminds her of what? The past hurt. So it's okay for us to say, let it go. 
Easy enough for those of us that are not living with that in our hearts. And I know, I know a young adult of my acquaintance who still feels deep, deep anger um, towards his father and mother for separating when he was a young child. And this is interesting because the father and mother are on good terms. They even go to family reunions together. They get on very well. But every time there's a family, family reunion, he resists going. And when he does go, it brings up that, the bile of that resentment and that, that, that anger that he has. Till his friends and his siblings say, Mom and Dad have gotten over it and have moved on with their lives. You know, why are you still living at age 10? But it's not all that easy to let go. And a client recently said to me, Reverend John, I know I should let go and let God, but how do I do it? And that's a good question. So I wanted to use my scenario of letting go of impatience as perhaps an example of how you can really let go. I found that instead of trying to let go of my impatience with everything, I'm more successful if I practice letting go of little things as they arise. And letting go of impatience meant I had to really lighten up. And it reminded me that all of us have addictions, to addictions to persons, to places, to things, to the way. You know, you know what an addiction is? An addiction is a mental construct that we have of how the world should be. So you can be addicted to even things that are good. I had a coworker who was addicted to tidiness. Now when you have an addiction, you not only have it for yourself, you have it for everybody else. So this tidiness had nothing to do with efficiency. So my desk looks like a, a hurricane has just passed over it, and her desk was absolutely clean. Just the one piece of work before her, you know, everything right on spot. And she was so addicted to tidiness that she couldn't work beside me because my desk was untidy. So that's the same kind of addiction that makes us go into other people's houses and straighten the pictures on the wall. <laughs> Guilty me, Rana? And the way to handle an addiction, the way to let it go, oh, you know, my, lots of people in this church know my addiction to, to, to punctuality. I would be so, I was so addicted to punctuality that if a friend was coming for me to go to the movies at 8.15 and 8.45 come and I don't see them, I have on my pajamas and it's my bed, I gone. I was so addicted to people being punctual that I couldn't even say what happened, the car broke down, everything is all right, you know, everybody in the family, nobody dead. I was so vexed, all I, you know. The only excuse for being late coming for me is if somebody called and said there's a body on a slab somewhere in the morgue. That doesn't make sense, that, that your addictions begin to interfere with your relationships and with, because you think the world should be this way, um, you can't live with anybody who doesn't have the same mental construct. Follow me? So, so the letting go is really very important, and the way to do it is to up-level your addiction to a preference. Now, when you prefer something, you try your darndest to have it. So if you're coming to pick me up at 8.15, I'll say, you know me in the time thing, don't be late. But if you are late, it doesn't destroy the relationship. I prefer stew peas and rice on a Friday, but if I get home and there's curry chicken, I don't throw the, stew, the, the curry chicken through the, through the kitchen window and upset my, the person who cooked it and upset myself and spoil the day. I can just say, I'd have preferred stew peas and rice, but curry chicken is nice too. So when you have a preference, you still try to get it, but when you don't, it doesn't destroy the relationship. Does that make sense? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. So you'll be amazed at how many things you hold on to. People even hold on to destructive, self-destructive patterns of behavior because they're comfortable in it, they're addicted to that feeling that it gives them, and they don't know how to let go. People with codependency issues also have trouble letting go of the tendency to overprotect loved ones, and they often do it by becoming nagging or arguing or manipulation in their attempts to hold on and to get things done the way that they think it should be. I know lots of grandparents who have that challenge because 
They know how to bring up a child. They've done it very successfully. And they don't want you, the parent, to have the same experience. Do it my way, because I know what's best. But everybody who's been a mother knows, or a father, you need to learn and make the mistakes yourself. Am I right or am I right? Yes. So, so we all have to do it our way, even though sometimes it, it's really painful for us to watch other people making the same mistakes that we know we could have, we could have saved them because we've walked that road before. We need to let go. And at a recent spiritual enrichment service, practitioner Vance Gardner shared an exercise that he got from the November Science of Mind magazine in an article by renowned neuroscientists Mark Waldman and Andrew Newberg. And it is an exercise in gratitude titled Gratitude, a Brain Changer. And I'm going to show you how gratitude really can help to heal your addictions. So I have adapted it for the New Year's workshop, and I'm going to do a part of it today with you, and we'll do the second part tomorrow. You game? You interested? Yes. Waldman and Newberg contend that gratitude is such a powerful brain changer that, and I quote, when children and adolescents practice gratitude, their grades go up, this is from research, their stress goes down, family relationships improve, and high-risk behaviors decline. Best of all, spiritual resilience will grow." Unquote. And so you're going to do your assignment. And I know sometimes I give you an assignment, and you say, yes, I will do it. And you know, beef, me not pork, as we say in Jamaica. You go home and forget all about it. So guess what happened? I want you to do this assignment right now. You game? Good. I want you to turn to page nine of your program. OK. And you see a space there at the bottom of the page that's provided for reflections. For a moment right now, think of one negative feeling, thought, or emotion that you have been struggling with. Think of one negative feeling, thought, or emotion that you have been struggling with. And make it a recent one, or it can be one that you've had for years, but, make, but you, you, I'd like you to make it so that you're still struggling with it. A negative feeling, thought, or emotion that you have been struggling with. And write it in that little space at the bottom of page nine. You don't need to write a whole, a whole blog, just a few words or sentences to remind you of that negative feeling, thought, or emotion. Everybody got one? Yes. Two people said yes. 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 Now, turn to page two of your program. And at, in the space at the bottom of the page provided for recording ways to apply spiritual practice, Write down at least three things that you feel grateful for right here, right now, today. Write down at least three things that you are grateful for right here, right now, today. Right now, this minute, what are you grateful for? You're going to find that the more you write, the more you will feel your negativity simply melting away. And you know what? You really can't think of two things at the same time, you know. So if you're thinking about what you're grateful for, you can't be thinking about your favorite bad feelings. 
and your deeply held resentment. Am I, am I right again? Wow. How many people got three things they're grateful for? Can I see a show of hands? Very good. How many people got more than three? How many people had none? Oh, thank you, God. Give, give me an amen. <laughs> it's that simple, my friends, and that powerful. Instead of struggling to let go of what no longer works for you, write it down so that you acknowledge it, and then turn from it and write your gratitude for all the good in your life. So you need to acknowledge what it is that's irking you, that has made you really uptight. And having acknowledged it, turn from it and focus on what it is you are grateful for. And we're going to do more of that kind of gratitude practice tomorrow, but that's just a sampling of how to work it. And by the way, I want you to detach the bottom of page nine where you wrote the negative feeling, thought, or emotion, and bring it with you tomorrow evening. Because as you know, if you've been to a New Year's workshop, we collect them and we burn them. So it's important that you didn't write anybody's name. We don't want to burn nobody. <laughs> so I said a negative feeling, thought, or emotion. And nobody that I know has any of those as their name. So don't write, I want to get rid of so-and-so. Um, good. Because that's malpractice. But we will symbolically burn that, symbolizing that we really are free of it once and for all. Friends, we can let go of destructive physical habits and take up a healthier lifestyle. We can let go of the belief that there may not be enough and practice generosity. We can let go of anger and replace it with love, inclusiveness, and compassion. We can let go of envy and replace it with genuine happiness at the fortune of others. We can let go of judgmental attitudes in favor of more tolerant and open-minded points of view. We can let go of the need to control everything and everyone, including God. So Reverend Sonia had us say, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth in, in our quiet time earlier. But I know so many people who say, hear God, thy servant speaketh. <laughs> Just make I tell you how I pre this. So, you can let go of the need to control everything and everyone, including even yourself, and just go with the flow of life in 2018 by practicing gratitude. When you practice gratitude for the good in your life, your New Year resolutions become New Year evolutions as you grow into greater and greater expressions of God. You know, you remember that wonderful round we used to sing when we were children, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream? You remember it? Because you were going with the flow. Um, some, I think it was Esther and Jerry Hicks um, who said, there are some people who go to the river with the canoe, put it in the water and start rowing upstream. And you know how much energy it takes? to go in the opposite direction. And they see people gently going down the stream, and they use their oars to just push them away from any rocks or any, any you know, um, bank embankments. And they're going gently down the stream while some of us are struggling. I've got to go the other way. I've got to go the other way. More, row harder. And then you end up exhausted, ruin your relationships, and say, I don't understand why my life doesn't go right. Master, can we play row, row, row your boat? Together, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Again, row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but this half. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Row, row, row your boat. Row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Gently down the stream. 
Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. <laughs> Thank you. Give yourself a hand. <laughs> Dr. Ernest Holmes, who gave the world this great teaching, and it's the 100th anniversary of the teaching called Science of Mind. He wrote a book called Creative Mind, which was published in 1918. I think it actually came on the market in, 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 in 1917, but it, oh, he wrote it in 1917, it came on the market in 1918. So that we're celebrating uh, the 100th anniversary of this great teaching this year. And so I, I have as our theme for the year, I think it's on the inside um, page of your program, in 2018, Science of Mind, we celebrate. Can we say that together? In 2018, Science of Mind, we celebrate. And you could say in 2018, all that I am, I celebrate. All that I have, I celebrate. So we can use it as a, a kind of mantra for the year. Holmes said, um, and I want to quote him, if I can find him. Yes, on page 234, paragraph four of the textbook, and I quote, if one would take time once a day at least to let go of all that is not true and lay hold of reality, let go of doubt, worry, condemnation, fear, and lay hold of life in its expressions of beauty, truth, and wholeness, his mental congestion would be healed, unquote. And Holmes had a brother called Fenwick. Fenwick L. Holmes, brother to Ernest, in a book he co-authored with a man named Masaharu Tan Taniguchi, who actually took the science of mind to Japan. Um, and the book is titled, The Science of Faith, gives this advice. Quote, learn to relax and let God do it. Believe that it is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom, as Jesus said. If you can let go your depression, fears, doubt, inferiority, then faith, exaltation, and belief in yourself will automatically grow and express." Unquote. So Fenwick Holmes and, Mas and Masaharu tell the story of Satakoma, a Giza girl who was studying art but not showing the desired progress. Her tutor constantly upbraided her for her lack of progress, and the more he did, the more apathetic she became. With this mindset, she was walking to her tutor's house, a little reluctantly, for a class, when all of a sudden, her attention was caught by something written on a blackboard at the entrance to the local branch of Sai Chona Ai, which is Japanese for science of mind. So next time anybody says, what church do you go to? You can say, Sai, oh, Sai, oh, merci. Mary put up your mouth. Say a chono ai. They say what? Must be obia your work. But anyway, we don't work obia. We believe in the power of truth. And the sign read, listen to this. It is better to believe you can become something rather than make something of yourself. It is better to believe that you can become something rather than make something of yourself. You know, so many times people who are addicted to a certain way of being, way of looking, a certain lifestyle, a certain way of behavior and of dressing want you to be the same. And so they want you to make yourself over in their image of what of the ideal husband, wife, child, friend, um, co-worker should be. But it is better to believe that you can be what you want rather than to let other people create you in their image and likeness or to believe that you have to force yourself to be something that you are not. When all the advertisements are saying, if you wear this perfume, if you drink this liquor, if you drive this car, if you live in this house, you will be a so-and-so. You know, you say, okay, I'm a banana. But the whole world says you should be a mango. And you try so hard to be a mango that what happens is you end up neither being a good banana, which is what you really are, or a good mango. So believe that you can be what you want to be and achieve what you want to achieve as a banana, which is what you really feel that you are. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, so that one little sign said to Satakoma, the geisha girl, look here, maybe you've been going about it all wrong. Start believing 
that you can. And so she went the rest of the journey to her, her tutor's home saying, I believe I can, I can. And you know, of course, this, the rest of the story, you know the rest of the story. She ended up doing much better at that lesson and at all future lessons. And more and more, she began to hear her students saying, oh, that's very good. Her, her tutor say, that's very good. Well done, that's very good. And she eventually mastered her art. Satakoma's story, my friends, though simple, contains an important lesson that you can use in your own life. It is a valuable secret which everybody ought to know, especially our parents, our caregivers, our teachers in bringing up children, and our people in business in managing their business affairs successfully. It's also good for the spiritual growth at which we are aiming in the new year. And the secret is this. Let go of merely wishing to do it and believe that you can do it. Whatever your intentions are for 2018, let go of wishing and saying, well, I've I tried this for the last umpteen years and I never succeeded. I'm going to try again. If you say you're going to try, you're setting up yourself for failure. Say, I can. And there's a wonderful, wonderful um, affirmation given by St. Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Can we say that? I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Say it in a half voice. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. And in, your, in a whisper, I can do all things through Christ. And in your heart, And that Christ is not somebody's last name. It's not Jesus' last name. The Christ is your sonship and your daughtership with the living Spirit Almighty. So you are the Christ. It's not just a one-time thing that uh, a label we put on Jesus, the master teacher. All of us are the Christ because all of us are the sons and daughters of the Most High God. So let us affirm, I have faith in faith and belief in belief. Together, I have faith in faith and belief in belief. I can because God in me can. I can because God in me can. I can because God as me can. I can because God as me can. My gratitude for this knowledge allows me to let go with a hop, step, and jump into a new year. My gratitude for this knowledge allows me to let go with a hop, step, and jump into a new year, a gloriously successful new year. Into a gloriously successful new year. And so to your friends say, hop, step, and jump with me into a gloriously successful 2018. Hop, step, and jump with me into a gloriously successful new year. Hop, step, and jump with me into a gloriously successful new year. My friends, Hop, skip, and jump with me. Make that leap of faith into a gloriously successful 2018. God loves you, and so do I. Happy New Year. Happy New Year.